I would like to welcome the first keynote speaker of tonight, Mr. Ewa Driehuis of Securelink. He will talk. Uh, he will perform his talk, Fifty Shades of Nasty. I really look forward to him. So give him a warm hand and welcome to Hacker Hotel. Thank you. So hello, I'm Ewart. Uh, I am from the Netherlands. I'm, uh, I was born and raised in Zeeland. I was born on a small island. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, it's my it's my honor to be here. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation uh, to talk about some of the stuff that I've seen in the, I would say, in the last 10 to 12 years. Um, I have, I've worked mainly in chasing cyber criminals. Okay, so I know my bias is very cybercrime focused, um, but but that is just you know that's just my past. I've learned some lessons. Hello. Uh, <laughs> my name is Ewart. <laughs> I'm from a small island. <laughs> yes. My mother actually, s funny story, my mother was a veterinarian. You, so you know an animal doctor? Um, and, um, and for the longest time I was supposed to take over her practice. So that all went well. Right, so I helped her on, on surgeries in the weekends. I remember uh, amputating a leg off of a Rottweiler dog, uh, and the, th the sucker was huge. And do you know something about when you amputate limbs off of an animal, it keeps twitching after it's detached? Um, so that's one of the lessons I learned. Um, turns out I am allergic to cats, so I couldn't take over her practice. But yeah, it was just as well because I bumped into a Commodore 64 and I was lost. I was completely lost. Program sprites and all of that stuff. And it only got worse when I, I connected to a BBS for the first time. And later, of course, when I connected my trumpet windsock on Windows 3 to the internet for the first time from my very home, um, you know, I knew this is absolutely, this is the future. And, uh, and I've been working in IT and tech and security ever since. It's been quite a long while. But the first, uh, I worked for Securelink. Uh, I've, I haven't done, done that all my life, but let's say in the last year. We're 700 people. Uh, we're in 10 countries. We just recently moved into China. Very interesting. D did you know about who of you has been to China? So have you tried to open your Facebook or Twitter or Uber or Google there? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you know what happens, right? It doesn't work there. So it's, it's the OPSEC involved into moving your security operations to China is quite interesting. Um, we serve 1,300 customers, uh, cyber, cyber defense centers, and that's, that's mainly my job is all the events that we're processing, I'm trying to, let's say, digest them and use that data in order to let's say, create trends. Uh, because a wise man once said, without data, you're just someone with an opinion. And I think that's totally true. Um, recently, you might have seen the news, let's say three weeks ago, that the Dutch Secret Service hacked the FSB. Right? You, you, you've seen this, right? Um, what, what, what actually happened, the interesting thing was not that because that stuff happens. There's geopolitics, there's hacking. The interesting thing was that people were attributing um, the DDoS attacks to Russia afterwards because it kind of felt logical after the AFD to FSB hack. Right? They, they got experts, they were telling the, the world is going to end and all of that kind, of, that kind of stuff. And in the end, it was just a guy with 40 euros uh, buying some DDoS attacks, some stressors and attacking some, some, uh, some banks. The interesting thing is, I'm like, I'm still thinking about the times I dialed into the internet and everything was amazing and free and open. And, and I think, what, what happened? What happened in 20 years that stuff got so messed up, we can't even do the, a, a, a DDoS without suspecting Russia is behind it. Are we becoming too paranoid or not paranoid enough? Well, like I said, in my work, 
I've seen some stuff. I don't pretend to have seen everything, but I've seen some stuff and I want to share some of this stuff with you. Maybe there's some connections that you guys didn't know yet existed. Maybe all of this stuff is, is totally not new for you. In that case, you know, I hope you enjoy the story. But let's dive into that. And like I said, this is, let's say, 12 years ago. Like I said, I, I, I followed the criminals. I tracked the criminals as part of my work at Fox IT. Um, they were actually cybercrime in those days was pretty much contained to Russians attacking banks and getting money out of the West and getting it into Russia. They were protected by something that's very, very powerful, and that's the border of Russia. Right? Because back then and today, what's up? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you had a question. <laughs> Sorry, Nick. So, um, yeah. So th that that was what ha what was happening then. For all the rest, there was a V. Um, so, and that was well. So the, the word cyber, I think, wasn't even invented yet, was it? Cybersex. Yeah. But who knows what? <laughs> 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 well, we we got our girlfriends through IRC back then, right? IRC. So, but. So, um, who knows where the word cyber actually comes from, where it originates from? <laughs> Am I mowing the grass in front of you? No, no, that's Greece. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and it was coined, I think, you know, made popular in William Gibson novels. Right, the first one, Neuromancer. Who's read Neuromancer? <laughs> that's awesome. I stood, I stood in front of a, you know, some of these uh, Palo Alto guys. 500 of them and it was only one hand and this is like 10 hands in 100 so awesome good for you um, I would read the novel by the way Neuromancer just do it if you didn't but this is where I think it all started and I just happened to be there I don't pretend to be smarter or whatever I was just lucky to be working in this space what happened is that well um, I, I know there's people in this room that know this guy this is Yevgeny Bogachev right you know who he is He's still the FBI's most wanted top cyber criminal right now, and there's a good reason for that, because I sometimes call this guy the Steve Jobs of cybercrime. Why? Well, Steve Jobs understood <coughs> that people need a user experience rather than a product or te technology. And he understood that as well. He wanted to create a user experience for criminals. Back then, criminals in Russia were brick and mortar criminals. They were doing human trafficking, drugs. Uh, they were doing prostitution, arms dealing, that kind of stuff. Huge logistical operations with quite some legal risk in it as well. And what he uh, thought is, I'll create this user experience. And um, I'll create a malware, make it super easy to use, because he also understood that criminals will likely not be rocket scientists. So I'll make it easy to use. And the only way where he thought that he could legally pretty risk free get the money was from banks. Now, can any one of you guess which banks they attacked for starters? Which country? Which country? Sorry? Russian banks. No. no. American banks. Nope. No. Dutch bank. Yes! <laughs> Why was that, you think? We were early to adopt online banking. I think that that's a pretty good reason. But uh, another reason, and uh, um, listen, I don't know for sure, but another reason might, l let's do a test. Who, of all the Dutchmen, right, we know there's 90% uh, of these people are Dutchmen. So who of you is not banking with ABN, ING, or Raybo? That's not a lot, isn't it? So all the rest is banking with the top three banks. So that means we have a relatively wealthy country. Right, that they all bank with one of three banks. So when we manipulate, create those web injects, you know, automating the, the website attacks, you know, the, the interaction steps in order to get the money out of the bank through the browser, browser manipulation. We only need to have three banks in order to target, let's say, 15 million people, which are relatively wealthy. It's also a super small country, so we're not making anyone important angry here. So probably by chance they started attacking the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, a huge cybersecurity industry spun up. Now, one of the things is that, for example, in Europe today, in those things, we're well further ahead 
from the US, for example, they're still messing around with things like clearing house constructions. If you want to do a transaction from JPMC to Bank of America, it takes you three days. I'm not kidding either. You know, in Europe, it's you know seconds. That's the opportunity for criminals, but it's also the reason why in the US, you know, still this online banking fraud through web index is not as big. So they started here. And they moved, of course, to the rest of Europe. And the Bogachev guy, he was reasonably successful. He sold his kit malware, shoes to Russian criminals. They got a new attack type. They need, didn't need to smuggle beautiful ladies in the back of trucks. The logistics involved were way easier. They got to steal money with his, and he did the support as well. But his heart was in programming Zeus. His heart was never in supporting Zeus. And which is why these two gentlemen are relevant. And again, this is all a prologue, but I want to talk a little bit about this because this has been close to 10 years of my life. So and please allow me. So you don't create an ecosystem on your own. And, and Bogachev was no, you know, he was no exception. He needed other people to create this ecosystem with him. This guy was the first one. This guy saw Bogachev being reasonably successful, reasonably wealthy, but working hard. And he thought, if I'm the number two in this game, there's no shame in that. So I'm going to create something else. It's called Spy Eyes. You know, the other thing is called Zeus. We're going to use the same config files, you know, the, the same methods. I'm going to sell it for 2,000 bucks. It was actually pretty buggy. It crashed all the time. You know, criminals were pretty angry. You know, they called him up. Hey, it doesn't work again, you bastard. And then he did a little bit more support, but he made some money and that was all good. Now, this guy, interestingly, uh, he didn't like the support, yeah, and, and who would have blamed him? Because, you know, who of you has worked in support in his life? <laughs> right. So, when do you get the call that everything's gone to shit? When do you get that call? Exactly. Friday afternoon, 10 minutes to 5, right? And it's no different for him, you know? And if you're called on a Christmas by a Russian criminal who needs help, what do you do? You're going to say, yes, sir, <laughs> I'm going to help you because these criminals are very skilled in breaking your kneecaps with baseball bats and stuff. So you help them. He got very tired. You see the rings around under his eyes and he said, I need to ditch this support stuff. And then his customer said, no, no, Evgeny, you're not. Yeah, we need your support. We paid for the toolkit. You're going to deliver the support. And he said, well, you know what? And if I can find someone to do it for me, would that be OK? And said, well, maybe. So then he called that guy. And that guy said, well, well, you want me to do the support for Zeus? Wow, what an honor. I'll do that. So and then he said, cool, because I'm done. I'm out of this business. I'm retiring. No, he didn't. <laughs> but he said that he was going to retire. And I know there's people in this room that know what he actually did. And this guy took over support. He made a little bit of money. And then he invented the first rule in being a successful cyber criminal. Okay? Because when he made a little bit of money, he celebrated with a holiday to Costa Rica. Now here's the first rule in being a successful cyber criminal. Don't go on a holiday to Costa Rica or <coughs> any other country with an extradition treaty with the US. It's not wise. You might have made the FBI angry and they arrested him. And, uh, and that was a photo of that arrest. So the first rule. These guys invented the second rule of being a successful cyber criminal. I know, I'm, I know I'm talking for a long time, 10 years of my life, indulge me. And this is the second rule. So these guys were like, hey, these guys are making a lot of money using this. We want to do that as well. So they started something called Carburb, and they were like, you know, there's a lot of work in doing all these web injects. You know, we need to look at the banking website, understand the business logic. We need to translate all the fields that we're injecting and all the overlay screens and stuff. And it needs to be in perfect, needs to be aligned, needs to be in perfect uh, foreign languages as well. We don't want to do all that. How about we just do it in Russian? You know, that's way easier. We know Russian. So they created Russian web injects and they attacked Russian banks. Now here's the second rule in being a successful cyber criminal. Can you guess it? Oh, shit, 
easy peasy, you will make another party very angry, it's called the FSB. These guys were arrested more, well, let's say, well, twice, okay, so, I don't know, twice, they, they, they were arrested, released on bail, fled the country, started up again, arrested again, and so on, but, and, and then they vanished, and later came back as another group, but, but that's the thing, we're, we'll come there later, you know, they, they, they were, became part of the flatworm society, as I call it. And this is the, you know, the, the prologue, the criminal ecosystem. The interesting thing was, and again, I've, I've mentioned I worked for close to 10 years in this field, no one cared. No one cared for a very simple reason. If you were defrauded, the banks gave you the money back. Now, not because it was you know, a lot of money or because, you know, but they were all closing their local offices they were all moving to online and they needed to guard the trust in their online channel. So they all gave everyone, no matter how stupid you were, no matter, no matter if you forced your password into a criminal's hands, you still got your money back. So the risk was close to zero for, for customers. At the height in the Netherlands, I think back in 2012, we're now talking, I think they sold close to 42 million euros from all the banks in the Netherlands, the criminals. <laughs> Do you know how much 42 million <laughs> is for a bank? Nothing. Yes, it's nothing. It's not worth mentioning. They're not doing all of that security stuff because they're afraid for their revenue. They're afraid for the trust in the channel. You know, that's pretty much it. They want, I don't want to lose you. So nothing was happening. No one cared. That changed later. And this is actually where my story starts. So, let's go on. The criminals understood that we're robbing these banks, we're making some decent money. Yevgeny Bogachev retired. Rebo Demon in jail. You know, <coughs> Bogachev didn't retire, of course. You know, wh what he saw is he didn't want to do the support, but he thought, you know, my customers are making way more money than I am. Using my tools, they're doing these criminal things and they're making way more money. So he joined one of his own customers and they started up and then they also thought, listen, the Bogachev guy, so if I really want to be the successful criminals, I should accept the fact that I'm a very good techie, I'm the Steve Jobs of cybercrime, but I'm not the best businessman as well. So he found, he surrounded himself with people who actually were skilled in that. And that started a very interesting um, you know, the chain of events and one of the things that one of his, his, his partners did is focus on the most important process in cybercrime, we'll get there later. But one of the things that they wanted to do is gain more ROI. Their tool was their botnet. Right? Their botnet was, uh, th that was their hammer and nails if you will. <coughs> right? So it was important for them and they wanted to get more money out of those botnets. And that's what they were doing. So they sort of, are there more ways to actually get money out of these botnets? And, and this is one of the innovations they did. So it was a Bogachev invention, again, CryptoLocker. Now ransomware existed before Game Over Zeus. It existed before Bogachev. You know, I think the oldest known variant, does any one of you know how old the oldest known variant of, of crypto ransomware is? It's DOS era. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's 1989, crypto ransomware. So it's that old. It was called the AIDS virus. You know, people like Miko Hupen, you know, he, he wrote blogs about that. The guy hasn't aged one bit, by the way, and, and unlike me. But um, and and um, so it was definitely not new. But you know, he was the Steve Jobs of cybercrime. Steve Jobs never created an original idea. You know, he, he, the rounded corners existed before Steve Jobs. Wi-Fi, 3G existed before him. Gorilla Glass existed. He whipped them all together and created the iPhone. And that's pretty much in the same way as these guys operate. They think, well, we have so many bots that we don't use. The majority of bots are not, you know, they are they're primed with web injects for Dutch banks, but the bot is in Germany. Or the bot is in the Netherlands, but the victim is not banking at ING. Or, yes, it's in the Netherlands, the victim is banking at ING, but he's not using the PC while our operators are listening in. So there's so many ways not to make money using those botnets. I thought, we need other ways to make money out of these bots. And then I thought, 
maybe this will work. Crypto ransomware. So that's what they did. And the reason why we found out back then, and, um, and kudos for this, of course, go to the team at, at Fox IT, um, is, is that they actually, in an investigation, they found an actual tarball with half a million private keys in it. So why would that be on the, you know, why would the fraudsters have this? And that was how they linked that. My God, the, could these be the private keys used in the crypto locker ransomware attack? And of course they were. And actually they created an infrastructure you know, together with FireEye um, to, uh, to return the, the, the files back to the victims. It was quite a cool uh, infrastructure because you could upload your infected file. It would then be matched with the database with half a million private keys until we got a hit and then we could return that private key with a little bit of a decryption tool. It was there, it was used for a few months. Uh, I think we helped about six or seven thousand people getting their files back for free. And this is of course, you know, if you don't have a weakness in your algorithm, like, you know, for example, Petia had a little bit of a shortcut in the Salsa 20 algorithm is why, um, you know, it was easier, you know, through through mechanism to get your files back, for example, later. But this was just through really hardcore running them through all the private keys. Um, whatever, you know, happened is they thought, you know, ransomware will be the next big thing. This will be the ROI, the money maker, the game changer for us. And it was a game changer in a sense, because the risk for sure spread from the banks to everyone. Everyone was now a potential target. And, and, and that, I think, was the most important thing, although ransomware is, of course, not all is cracked up to be. Right? What they were after was moving away from the big investment late return, as with online banking attacks, they wanted to do small investments, have immediate returns. The thing is, Ran ransomware is evil software, of course, but were they successful? Let's take a look. They were not successful. This, these are the FBI numbers. They're releasing this every year. The, uh, I see three numbers and I'm eagerly awaiting 2017 numbers. And this is the top 40 of online crime types. So let's look for ransomware. It should be right up there high, right? So BEC, what's that? Oh, CEO fraud, in case you're missing uh, the marketing. Romance fraud, is that the number two moneymaker for cyber criminals? Is that real? You know, not the investment corporate. Wow, let me help you. Here's ransomware. This is how much criminals made in the US with ransomware. It's the number 24 moneymaker. So in other words, there's 23 ways for criminals to make more money <coughs> than with ransomware. So in that sense, ransomware is a total failure. And it's failed for multiple reasons. Because, of course, it impacts us in a huge way. It destroys. If we don't pay, we don't get our files back. If we don't have a backup, you know, we lose our files. It destructs. And that's obviously what is now being used for more than being an actual money maker. Criminals needed a low risk, low yield, entry level type of attack you know, for new cyber criminals to enter the game. And ransomware was supposed to be it. It was a low yield attack for sure, but it also became a high risk attack because of all of the collateral damage. You know, people got themselves into the attention of the FBI and other parties. You know, you don't want to do this anymore. And in 2017, of course, the proof was in all the WannaCry, the Petia, uh, which were later attributed with a little bit of certainty, probably <coughs> no money makers at all. You know, WannaCry didn't even have a mechanism to return <coughs> the files. Right, for, for ransomware, Obviously, you guys know this, but for ransomware, in order to return the files, you need to uh, store some kind of a unique identifier in a CNC, store you know, the, the private key with which the files are encrypted, and then later on payment, you need to match the payment to the right bot and return private key to that particular victim. There's a very simple rule if you want to be a successful ransomware criminal. If your victims pay, you give them the files back, <coughs> and you do that as soon as possible. 
Now WannaCry did not even have such a mechanism did not st store a unique identifier. There was no way for them to even give you the files back if they wanted to. Notpetya had only one email address, if I'm not mistaken, a Proton mail email address that was taken down immediately um, in a zealous effort. Uh, so that took away their only way to set that process in motion. So they could not give the files back. That process was broken, so it wasn't a money maker. It wasn't, but the collateral damage was super, super high. And that's of course, you know, how we see now that ransomware has evolved into a weapon, a weapon of destruction. And then the latest attack types like, you know, the, let's say the Olympic Destroyer doesn't even encrypt anymore, I think, it just destroys files. Ah, let's skip the encryption part altogether. Let's not even pretend we're a ransomware anymore. And that's how this is evolving. So, yes. Ransomware has failed as, as a big ROI generator for criminals. There's something else, of course. There's other ways for criminals to make electronic currency off of us. I think we all can guess what it is, right? Yeah, mining efforts. And, and mining efforts, is, they're, they're pretty <coughs> cool because you can, you can designate a botnet to do mining but you can also mine in the browser. So there's pretty non-invasive ways to start mining Monero, because of course, nowadays as a criminal, you want to have Monero, because the traceability is the least of all the electronic currencies, but, um, and that's of course what's, ha what's happening. Um, I'm following this data in our, in our CDC, right, and I'm thinking already I'm seeing as much uh, uh, mining, criminal mining, both through botnets, hacking, and in the browser, as ransomware attacks. Well, only three months ago, uh, there were three times as more ransomware atta attacks as as mining attacks. So, it's it seems to be taking over, right? I don't know where it will <coughs> go from here, but it will be mining. That will be my guess. But there's one other thing they learn, and this is where the partners of the Bogachev guy uh, become so important. The guy understood he was not a businessman. Uh, so one of the things that's always the most difficult process for any time of criminal operation, I've been told, is laundering the money. Laundering the money is super difficult. And why? Because of you know, the banks, they, they are super good at detecting um, let's say, uh, criminal transactions and fraudulent transactions. But back in 2006, indeed, you needed a thousand money mules to launder a million dollars. So back then, it was definitely the bottleneck of the criminal process. So they had all kinds of, of methods for that. But five years later, they built, started building networks of fake companies on Cyprus <coughs> through the periphery of, of the Soviet Union, um, going into Russia, through China, because money laundry sometimes involves actual laundering. For all of you who've, who've seen Ozark on Netflix, who, who've you seen that? Yeah, so watch that as well. Money laundry sometimes involves actual laundry to make the bills look older, right? And for that you need people, and where's the people? They're the cheapest in China. So there, there, there's that as well. And then of course with the Bank of Bangladesh, which was the ultimate money laundry action, is here they were using four, only four money mules, gaming companies in this case, to, uh, to launder 81 million. So that was not their bot bottleneck anymore, and it sparked a whole new era of capabilities and possibilities for these criminals. And this is pretty much where we are still today, is, is with regards to what, what have these guys done? Well, Bogachev, of course, he didn't retire. We know that, right? He, he started uh, Game Over Zeus you know, with his customer, and he created a true crimeware platform as a service. Um, and they diversified, you know, their, their ransomware attacks were their first attempt, uh, not really super successful. They only made 2.1 million with the first crypto locker, right, that, which was not a lot. Only 1.3% of their victims paid. So that was not a lot, but they, they tried, they innovated, they were doing other things, they were interacting with spies, they were doing, they were, they were doing something very nifty, which was running big data on us. So their malware, they didn't, they, they don't 
target us with a sp specific intent. They target us, they infect us as much as they can, and then they do one thing and one thing only, which is collecting data. And when they collect this data, they just store it in their you know, Elasticsearch databases and they do nothing. And then they, when they have enough data, they query the data. For example, first thing they want to see is, hey, is any of these, sorry, <laughs> sorry buddy, is, is any of these bots inside of a corporate network maybe? And when they find that, they splice them off. They, they can, you know, they can just see: Am I connected to an Active Directory? Am I running Oracle or SAP processes? Am I running any specific admin tools? You know, there's all kinds of ways to detect if you're in a corporate network. And when they find that, they splice them off, put them in a separate container. And because they now have so amazing money laundering capabilities, they can actually invest a lot of time into robbing you blind all these attacks are becoming more bespoke. And one of the examples I want to share with you is, uh, is an interesting one we've seen in, in, our, uh, in our CDC, is, um, is they enter a network you know, through a click, you know, re pretty regular, if someone clicks a, 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 an infected document, they're on that PC. Then they're doing the lateral movement until they are on the CRM, the Customer Relationship Management, you know, the big database in the big business with all the customer. Then they find the invoice templates. Then they edit the invoice templates and they put a big red sign on it. Our banking account changed their customer. This is the new banking account. And then they move out again and wait for the money to roll in. That's one of the things they do. So th th their attacks are becoming way more bespoke and, and way more artisanal than they used to be. So, so nowadays, for, for people in your network, you're defending your networks, if you're blue teaming, if you will, these kinds of techniques, like lateral movement that were previously only associated with espionage, is now th something that you need to take care of. You know, this is happening. This is not, and, and can happen pretty much to anyone. Fraud as well. Ransomware, of course, not so popular anymore, but extortion, yes. Extortion, you know, in the US, they're, on most, they're attacking uh, clinics, um, so cosmetic surgery clinics, for example, stealing files of VIP customers and then ransoming those files. Now, we're gonna publish this unless you pay $2 million. They're making crap loads of money. And that's all you know, those, those bespoke things. But then, of course, there's the bulk of the data. The bulk of the bots are still the regular old bots. They're still <coughs> doing all the, all the same things. They're stealing credit cards. They're doing the retail frauds. They're doing the web injects. They're manipulating stuff. Um, and, of course, they still do some ransomware, although it's rapidly now, you know, let's say the last-ditch effort is now rapidly being replaced by uh, Monero mining. So, so that's what it is today. It's, it's, it's an enterprise. And, and the, the reason why I call it Flatworm Underground is, of course, exhibited in 2014 in May. Now, these guys, these Game Over Zeus guys, they pissed off the FBI so much that they said, enough is enough. Now, I'm not taking this anymore. So we're going after them. But of course, they are protected by that border of Russia. And also, their network is peer-to-peer, -peer. you know, game over Zeus, peer-to-peer -peer Zeus. You can't just decapitate it, you know, by downing the CNCs or sinkholing the stuff and so on. It was, you know, pretty elaborate. So any of the bots, in theory, could pick up commands and become the new master. So how do you do that? So they went after the Bogachev guy himself. What they did is they sent him a, a big brown bubbly envelope and uh, with all the data they had collected on him, and, uh, and when the guy got that envelope at his home, he was scared shitless and he spent some frantic days into deleting his own infrastructure and then fleeing. As luck would have it, there was some kind of mechanism built into peer-to-peer -peer Zeus that he held this, some kind of a master key. So apparently there were some trust, trust issues and the master key wasn't shared amongst the team. So that effectively rendered the botnet inoperable. And that was when Bogachev really retired, only this time it wasn't his choice. Supposedly, he lives in the black, at the Black Sea, has a very nice apartment. Supposedly, he has a boat or two and some nice cars. Um, and a few weeks ago, I was visiting uh, the US Embassy in London, and a guy told me, when I told this story, 
Oh, didn't you know? The BBC went ahead and looked for him. So, seriously? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they found him. <coughs> they rang his doorbell. Now, this is my guess. If the BBC knows where you are, the FSB knows where you are. Bear this in mind for the last part of the story. But this is why it's a flat warm underground. You know, what happened when the FBI went after that group? They cut it in half. But what happens with a tapeworm if you cut it in half? Did you know? One half grows a new head, the other half grows a new tail. Game over zoo split up, Dyer and Drydex. Yeah, both got actions. Uh, I think Drydex was first, but it failed. Uh, and then another one, it was successful. Uh, and then Dyer got down by the FSB and there was some drama around that. But you know, Dyer later came back as Trickbot, but with some components with from the Carburb guys. You know, the car, the guys, you know, the guys were too lazy to translate a web inject. You know, that became TrickBot. But in other words, this is never going to go away. And their processes, their money launder systems that they build up are now so big and elegant, they're even used by regular criminals. A and these groups, they, they don't care about their tools and about their bots anymore. And the game cybercrime and the protection against cybercrime and attribution and intelligence is not about malware anymore. Now it's, it's about other things, about following the money, following the process. What happens when you down a botnet? What happens to your contractor if he drops his hammer? Nothing. They grab a new hammer. That's it. They're just tools. Now it's just malware. No biggie. We'll just create a new one. And they'll create an old one off the shelf. They take it, modify it, bang, back in business. This problem is never going to go away. We're now at the 75% mark. Until this time, I'm pretty sure all of this stuff happened, and it's, you can all look it up on the internet. It's all, it's all really happened. <coughs> but we're now entering into a little bit of a slippery area, because it's getting worse, in my mind. Right? Because this is just all, let's say, cybercrime. And it's just crime. You, know, you can insure yourself against that stuff, but it becomes worse. And, and, and this, is, this is, of course, why. Because I believe, and from this moment forward, there's going to be some speculation and stuff. Okay, so if you can't quote me on this, you know, because I don't know, I don't know, I don't have all the data, I, bits and pieces, attribution takes time, and so on. But here we go. I think everything we see happening today is in some way influenced by geopolitics. Right? It's not about anything else. The first thing, of course, way back, you know, is, is that Putin had said that when he was asked this a few months ago, listen, all those cyber criminals coming from Russia, you know, I, that, that's, that's kind of convenient for you, is it? And Putin said, oh, listen, these are, you know, these are criminals, these are artists, you know, they're just creative guys. It's, you, I can't just contain them, I don't know what they're doing. You should allow them to practice their art and I can help if they're patriotic. Right? So there, there's this deniability. Deniability is always very strong within this one. But here's the second thing. You know, we, we know that the BBC knows where Bogachev is, so probably the FSB knows where he is as well. So second question. If they know where he is and he sits on, let's say, 30 million, Game Over Zoo stole about 200, you know, assessment by the FBI, that's why 200 million, um, and he <coughs> owns a chunk of that, you're a very rich person in Russia. So you sit there, why do they allow him to remain there? Why don't they arrest him, kick him to the gulag? Take his money, fill a government deficit. Well, easy peasy. Is that, is that a question? Yeah. Like exactly, and and that's the, um, as we in Dutch would say, the butvrij, right? The butvrij that Putin <coughs> has for cyber criminals. You know that that's one of the things, and he's done that consistently. You're absolutely right, right? So why do they allow him to stay there? Well, of course, you know, it's very easy. He does consultancy, the old consultancy job. 
Now, the other day, uh, a few weeks ago, there were five, I think, Russian hackers were announced to be indicted in the DNC case. I know there's many researchers out there that think that this guy has something to do with that. Right? This is, of course, all speculation. But what would we do if some of the most talented and experienced hackers in the world would live in our country and all the rest of the world was against us? <laughs> yeah. Of course, you know, it's not so strange. So they have their <coughs> criminals, they're super experienced, but criminals, they're trained to make a mess, right? They don't care about leaving log files, about fingerprints, footprints, they don't care. They're protected by the border, they will never get arrested. So they don't care. So they, you need to retrain them to get some espionage skills. You want to train them to do lateral movements, to sweep the log files behind them, to stay hidden, and all that, the stuff that the Chinese are so good at. Right? So you can't just use them one-on-one, -on -one, but fair enough, you have something to work with. And for a small country at, at odds with anyone in the world, that's a pretty good bet. And remember, you're up against the US who has a cyber command of 10,000 people, right? It's an asymmetrical game. Yeah, the, the thing is that the US is our friends, so we see it from their side. But this is something that's happening. Second thing, of course, <coughs> WannaCry. Yeah, it was attributed to North Korea. Who of you believes that it was North Korea? So seriously? <laughs> well, everyone else does. <laughs> mm, nope. Yeah. Cool, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure myself, you know. Code similarities, yeah, well, there, I'm, there's sure to bound to be a lot of code similarities, right? So, but w whatever it is, it might be mercenaries, it might be, but, but the, the sure thing is that ransomware is now a weapon. It's used in geopolitical campaigns. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the stuff like uh, when we learn from Hype Modokok that our own a a Secret Service is hacking the FSB. There is some crazy stuff going on here, and we can't even do a modest DDoS without suspecting at least interference from Russia. Yeah, spending 40 bucks. On yeah, 40 bucks. <coughs> yeah. So, and 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 so, this is crazy. You know, we're becoming super paranoid. We have a good reason to, but everything that's happening is in some way fueled activism, uh, cyber crimes, all fueled by some of the bigger uh, countries out there. The US has partial visibility of everything that happens in the world. They have these amazing, they have Uber, they have Google, they have AWS, uh, over 365, and 20% of them, of us, of the whole world logs into that on a daily basis, partly visibility. The Chinese have full control of everything that happens within their country. They've created an island, totally different approaches, but these are two strategies that work. It's all the rest that's hacking the crap out of everyone else to get an information position. Uh, this is the race for data supremacy. The US and China are winning. Russia is not, I think, right, which makes them scary because they're they're you know they're cornered they can c do crazy stuff so this is all about impact increasing impact uh, you guys understand all this 10 years ago no impact really no one cared uh, but today my money is at stake my freedom is at stake my democratic values are at stake my country is at stake so when people ask me what's going to be the next big thing well Okay, fair enough, it's, it's either going to be AI or it's going to be the IoT, right? But this is something that when you, when you extrapolate what cyber criminals are good at, extortion is one of the things that's always make them a lot of money. I'm prepared to pay for my safety more than for my data, I can assure you. So my expectation is that this IoT thing that everyone is super scared of might actually be something. <coughs> You know, if you're targeting my car while I'm in it, my hotel room, locking it up with me in it, I'm prepared to pay more than from a bunch of data that I have backup for. So that's going to be the future, I guess. Well, impact is just impact, right? The risk is defined by vulnerability. You might have uh, seen, we're in the Netherlands here, this is pretty much the first place where you can get, if you drive from the coast, where we're above sea level. It's all the farther west, we're below sea level. So 
we might be impacted by things like uh, global warming, rising sea levels, all that stuff. This is the difference between impact and risk. We're actually not, because we're so good at pumping water away that when the whole of Europe floods, there's going to be one dry hole where the Netherlands is, <laughs> and we're going to sit <coughs> slap bang in the center. And that's the difference between risk and vulnerability. You know, some of us, especially in this room, are actually very well known with this stuff. We're smart paranoids. We know this stuff is true. And we know which of the stuff is not true. So we're well protected. You know, there's others that are going to be way, way more hard, uh, hit hard by this stuff. But whatever it is, I believe this race is not a race in which we're always one step behind. I believe it's a game of leapfrog. Like the criminals have been using big data against us, we invented big data, right? Criminals were too lazy. We invented it and they used it on us. They did it successfully. We invented I AI, it's just more big data. They might use it against us. It's a game of leapfrog, but we need creative people in order to push this forward. Um, I think this was snuck here <coughs> from another slide. <laughs> this, this, is, this is something that you would say to a management team. Right. Well, for sure we're going we're gonna to have some, we're gonna have some challenges. You know, th these are some of the lessons I've learned over the, over the past few years. I, I'm, I'm kind of unsure what, where it will head. <coughs> but I feel that we're kind of on the, on the verge of something happening with regards to geopolitics, cyber, cyber weapons, cyber warfare. You know, it's not happening yet, but you can feel the tension brewing. You can feel the geopolitics and the cyber intermingling, and it could be very explosive. You know, what we need to be is we need to be ready for that. We need to be smartly paranoid, and we will make it. So thank you for your attention. Are there uh, questions for Ewart? Yes, Ewart. I have one question. <laughs> I'll throw it. Uh, well. <laughs> yes, um, as cyber criminals have uh, provided very uh, efficient support in ransomware cases, for example, they were very reachable. Um, is there a chance of something happening with their mining on IoT or computer devices that they or browsers that they provide better support than other companies in so that the mining keeps working? on your router or your washing machine or whatever? <laughs> Is there a risk of them writing new firmware for a router so they stay longer in the game? <laughs> they don't get obsoleted by, by, by companies uh, in advance, something like that? Ah, that's an interesting question. Well, but I, they already have, haven't they? You remember the case in, in Brazil where they rewrote the firmware of about five million uh, home routers? Yes. A and they, they poisoned DNS and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, okay, but th so that's going to happen more, you think? Well, yeah, I, I think it's, listen, there's such an amazing inflow of devices from China. They're all built for three bucks. You know, there's never going to be nano security in those devices. They're never going to, you know, the corporations creating them will never support them. So there's opportunity. Um, well, yeah, well, yeah, I do think so, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Other questions? You kindly mentioned the Netherlands um, being a really nice floodplain. Uh, we use a lot of collective inf infrastructure. Um, what do you think that makes us a really, really nice prey? Um, so, so here's the thing. So, I, the I investment is too big. You think? Sorry. The investment is too big. It's for too for difficult. For us, I, I don't think we're that interesting, if I'm honest. Uh, maybe that's because I was born on that small island I was talking about and raised humbly. Uh, but I don't think we're that interesting. Uh, the thing is, so, you know, this morning I was chatting about um, could they open, uh, let's say, a dam or a dike? You know, could they? I don't know, maybe they can. We have show then. You know, I'm, I'm sure if you do uh, spend a few hours on show then you could find something. Right, so I'm sure they can, but here's the thing. I think the world started to recognize that it's, it's just as much an act as war as dropping a bomb somewhere. So you only do that if you are ready to, to expect the counter. And we do have a lot of very big friends. 
So that technology-wise, it's possible to do bad things in the Netherlands. It's not necessarily mean that it's going to happen. In this case, in politics, opportunity does not make the thief. <coughs> it's diplomacy and that kind of stuff. And I don't know a lot about that. There's a question in the back. Where? All way in the back. Well, I have a question in regard to your presentation. One thing that uh, you perhaps um, uh, forgot to mention was RBN and their role into the Georgian invasion and into the complete killing of their infrastructure, making it that it took three days for us to even know there was an invasion in the first place. Yeah, no, that, that was kind of cool, wasn't it? Um, well, obviously you know a lot about that, so you know that the, the thing that they did again was to use their plausible deniability. They didn't do it themselves, of course. It was those wonderful creative people that were all very angry at Georgia and they deals the crap out of them and they downed everything. You know, they couldn't help that happened. They rallied on forums, they all, uh, they, they told each other how to do it. Um, it was, I think it was the LOIC even, you know, the low orbit Ian cannon, you know, that was used back then. Or they were even just sending ping commands with big packets, you know. That's what they were, were doing, ping dash T, and, and that's how they taught themselves how to, Russia had nothing to do with that. They couldn't help the masses were being rallied, and that's the interesting thing, you know. You, it, that's why I think that activism, and also cybercrime, you know, like you said, the bootfrei of Putin, that's all playing into his political cards as well. I believe all of this stuff is in some way connected, and it would be very strange if it wasn't coordinated from nation states as well. And mind you, do, do not think that we don't do this too. We do, don't we? We hack cameras in the FSB, so are we better than them? This is just the game we're in. <laughs> so one of the things that uh, I noticed um, that is a big theme of uh, the hackers sell to the uh, are sold initially to other hackers, and now they're selling to uh, to governments. Uh, or uh, the one th trend that I've uh, I've seen, and uh, I imagine also goes on more essentially just my my opinion, uh, is that the the hackers who are actually de doing the de development are selling to both sides because that is much more common usually. Cool. Would that be the, what you've seen as well? So, I I think I missed quite a vital word in your remark. They're selling the they they're selling to both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they sell to governments and then those same hackers also sell to activists. Yeah, for sure, so for sure. And and selling sometimes is you, you know the story when Dutch people say, "Hey, New York used to be New Amsterdam, right? Uh, we sold it to the English." So there's two ways of selling. They're selling like, "You want this? Give me some money." And they're selling like, "Sell me this." Right, and, and that's of course in the criminal ecosystem. You know, the, the big zoo source code leak was of course um, s criminals threatening to beat up other criminals. And then the guy said, okay, so here's the source code, don't bother me anymore, now you know everything. And then it got out in the open. It, it's sometimes selling, sometimes it's stealing, you know, sometimes it's leaking. Yes, for sure. 